In 2005, singer Will Oldham and guitarist Matt Sweeney released the Super Wolf album, which has developed a cult following that includes Rick Rubin, who absolutely fell in love with the project. Now, 16 years later, they're back with the follow-up, Super Wolves. This new album was five years in the making, a leisurely pace that allowed Oldham and Sweeney to be incredibly intentional with their creative choices. Oldham, who's recorded under a number of different monikers in the past, including Bonnie Prince Billy, wrote all of the lyrics before sending them over to Sweeney to write his guitar parts. The duo also added a new flavor, tapping the West African musician M. Du Mokhtar to play guitar on a few tracks. On today's episode, Rick Rubin talks to Oldham and Sweeney about their work together, which Rick considers some of his favorite contemporary music, and it's also why he's used Sweeney on a lot of the sessions he's produced, including the Dixie Chicks, Cat Stevens, and Adele. Will Oldham talks about his philosophy on connecting with his audience, and how if this pandemic were to take us all, Superwolves would be a great album to go out on. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Rick Rubin with Will Oldham and Matt Sweeney. How are we being graced with a new Superwolf project all this time since the last one? Matt and I thought it it could be a good idea. We didn't think about it till till too late, but it could be a good idea to get up to speed with uh, your conversational style in this in this forum. So I was listening a little bit earlier today to uh, a conversation that you were having with Adam Cohen. You were saying that there's, you just can't control it. You can't control, he says specifically that a record isn't a fait accompli. And he has a beautiful little French Canadian accent <laughs> when he says it. And, and he, you know, and he goes on to say, even with the right songs and the right producer and the right blah, 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 you know, you can't guarantee. And you say, yeah, you can't, there's no, and I, and I feel like if you just, do something like take your time, you can kind of get close to guaranteeing it. So to answer your question, we just took a little bit of time. We wanted to make a good record. As, as you've probably experienced, most records that you probably feel strongly about, whether you participated in them or not, something did just happen, of course, that made them specifically rise above the other records. But having been aware of that, if you have the, the leisure, because you're doing other things, to build something slowly and just be sure that you only act when the charge is there. Absolutely. Would you say in the writing process, do you consider the audience or not, not at all? Yeah, no, it's, it's all about the audience. Like entirely. Yeah. The whole reason to sit down and write is for the audience. Interesting. It's probably less than 50, 50 that that would be the answer to people who write songs. Yeah. You never hear people say that. I feel like Chuck Berry is the kind of person who would say it. He would be 100%. a little more. He would be a little colder in the way that he phrased it. But but if you read about him talking earlier in his career, he's less less harsh. But yeah, people don't say that. I, ha- I had a revelation re- recently that I'll share with you, which is I've always worked towards this idea of greatness, and I didn't know what greatness was. But it, but that was the feeling. It's like it's not it's not about selling a lot. It's not about making anybody else like it. It's about It has to be great. It has to be great in a way where it stands up to the test of time and it's forever. And it's like the, the, um, the bar was higher. And recently I've come to realize that actually we're making art as an offering to God. And if you're making art for God, there are no shortcuts to take. There are no low vibration energies involved in the process. It's like, that's the, that's what we're really aiming for is this, um, a sharing on a different plane, really. I like to think that in what we do, or at least what I do, the offering is not the work. The offering is the connection made between the work and the audience. You know, my mother was a visual artist. Nobody ever saw her visual art. It's, it's great. But she, I would maybe say that those could be considered offerings to God because they weren't shared with anybody. So in and of themselves, that's what they were. But because our labor goes to making a connection, you know, you're you're asking for an audience, you know, for to have any degree of success, whether it's financial or spiritual or artistic, there d- does need to be some sort of a connection to a, a recipient, and so that that the connection itself, building a, a connection that you 
that you feel that is that is sturdy or beautiful or complex that that that's the offering that you're rather than the piece itself or rather yeah rather than the piece itself i've noticed at least in the context of superwolf particularly the first album there there are lyrics that i find they pull me in emotionally and then there'll be i'll call them surprises certain landmines lyrically that that you might not be expected in a song that sounds like these songs sound intentional unintentional definitely intentional i wish i could pull examples from from my brain i can think of songwriters like um john prine or bob mcdill who wrote a lot of songs that don williams ended up playing where do you know don williams music at mm-hmm. all a little bit. you know you know good old boys like me that song uh where he says you know uh you know, something, uh, I ran with the kids down this, a kid down the street who, you know, got himself something like burned up on bourbon and speed. And of course, in, in the chorus, when he says those Williams boys, and he says, Hank in Tennessee, and it, it still is always like something to marvel at. It's still a surprise. And it, and it keeps me coming back. The, you know, that song sounds like something you turn it on and it, it sounds exactly like what it sounds like. And then lyrically, he keeps confounding the sound of the song. I don't know. I feel all of a sudden I know I'm at home here. It's not, you know, this is where I belong. I belong in this thing that's a little more convoluted or labyrinthine than, but it's very friendly to, it's very open and loving and because it sounds like something that you love right away. But if it only was something simple like that, like a Farrah Fawcett poster or something, you, you know, you would lose interest after a little while. Instead, it has a little bit of creepiness or a little bit of gore in there that, that keeps you on your toes and, remembering that when the song starts again, you have the sense memory of this sounds pretty good, but it's actually even better than it sounds because the lyrics are going to take me someplace that the music is, is belying. Great. Do you, do do songs typically start with a concept or a lyric? What's your way in typically? I, I like these days. I like triggers for the past few years, my wife has done something for me, which I need to get her to do again, uh, is I put a piece of paper on the wall and every day I just ask her to write a song title on that piece of paper. And then that just gives me something to sit down and stay in shape with. And every once in a while, something like, you know, I think the song, my blue suit, uh, that it's on this new record. It was, it was a, Elsa title song where she just wrote my blue suit. But then then there's also, there's three songs on this record where I I, I, I think up at the end of the street, there was a bookstore and the, the guy who, the guy would be able to buy Overstock. Um, there was a buyer who bought Overstock and he curated his Overstock, you know, super discount new book selection amazingly. And he, he put on the table one day this uh, book called Falkland Road, which is about Mumbai uh, red light district. And it's just kind of one picture per two pages. um, And then a little, maybe a sentence or two sentences or three sentences that could be a a quote from an interview with one of the people who's in the photograph. And there's three songs from this record that, that came like, and and I was just sharing those with, because I hadn't shown them to Matt until just like yesterday. Right, Matt? Well, you hadn't shown them like that. I'd seen that photo, be- the first photo, the Good To My Girls photo. I know I'd seen Good that to before. My girls, yeah. yeah, I'd seen that just at your house, I guess, sitting around or something. Is that, I mean, right, yeah. right, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. And Rick, I almost sent you these pictures as, as pre-production, but then I said, fuck pre-production. But uh, I thought that that was a really fascinating way in and kind of an insight into how Will writes words, which is, you know, like you look at a photograph, for example. When I heard the song, Good To My Girls. Yeah, Good To My Girls, yeah. I thought for sure it was an autobiographical song. Well, it is. That's the thing. I thought it would, but I thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was you talking about your wife. I assumed you had either a daughter or more than one, and you were talking about being good to your girls. And then you get to the, the hard part, and that's more like... Um, self-reflection concerns you have about yourself might not even be true more like uh obsessive thoughts of not being good enough it's just interesting like that that's what i heard it was like oh it's this is this one's really about him well i mean there's no other source from which to, to truly draw to get a you know a multi-dimensional lyric 
So that it comes from, you know, that's the that's the idea is that it comes, uh, and, and triangulating, I can triangulate, you triangulate with this madam in order to make something that I can sing, hopefully, again and again and again and again and again and again and still engage, and then also an audience member can hear it again and again and again. And it comes from, you know, documenting a shared experience rather than a unique experience. What would be other lyrical influences for you historically? Danzig, Danzig. We've talked about this, Rick, but Danzig, yeah. I mean, Danzig, huge. I mean, he's huge. And and still, like, I understand that he was, you know, virtually a child when he wrote a lot of the, you know, the lyrics that he wrote in the 80s. And yet I get so excited by the potential energy that's wound up in his lyrics. They're just so incredible and so beautiful that I always think, well, that's something to continue to aspire to. Because if it, you know, too many writers write better as children than they do as adults, which is, I think, an absolute sin uh, that it's allowed to happen, you know, that the songwriters themselves allow it to happen and that people in the world allow it to happen as well, that that, that we don't ask more of our senior lyricists or senior singers, expect more from them rather than, oh, this is as good, you know, or comparing them to the past. Yeah. Wait, talking about all this stuff, can, can you devote, like, 35 to 40 seconds of, uh, around the phenomenon of, of, of uh, Glenn Danzig writing the song for Roy Orbison? Sure. Um, I had an opportunity to do a song with Roy Orbison and I could find, you know, I could cast any writer and I knew that Glenn loved Roy and I knew that he wrote great songs and I knew that he would write a different song than anyone else who might write a song for Roy Orbison would write, and I wanted to hear what that was. And he wrote, he wrote the song he wrote, and we went and we played it yeah. for Roy, me, Glenn, and Roy. I remember we went to Roy's house in Malibu, and Glenn played him the song, and he loved did it. Did Glenn just play it live for him, like played it with I a guitar? I think so. I think he did. Yeah. I can't really remember, but I think he did. Yeah. And then... So sick. And he's like, okay, I'm in. Let's do it. Yeah. But that takes a lot of, I mean, that's a nice, beautiful, complicated relationship to voice and melody and connecting to artists who are, makes so much sense. And, and, and also Glenn's song on the first American record is, that's, I think it's my favorite song on the, because um, he's so good, he's so brilliant at, uh, but, but knowing, I mean, you have to understand, you have to have a pretty deep understanding of what a lyric is, Rick, to, to risk, to take that risk to know that it's a it's a risk that's going to pay off because most people would would laugh at you you know I wouldn't laugh you know when we were when we were kids and we heard this legend that that Glenn had just you know was working with Roy Orbison we you know it took us a year before it we, we realized it was the truth it sounded so ridiculously far fetched and perfect um but you had to have an understanding of like oh well this guy understands how to build a song lyrically as well as melodically uh, and he probably studied under these masters, and so I can put him in the same room with these guys, and everything's going to be just fine. It's also interesting, this leads back to something we were talking about earlier, about people doing great work when they're young. The, we, had the, we had the elder statesman and Roy who could still do what Roy does, and we had the... the performatively. The, performatively, yeah. and we had the young energy... Of, yeah. of Glenn Danzig, like prime songwriting. And it, it, yeah. it and, and I guess you could say the same thing's true for Trent Reznor and Hurt with, with Johnny. It's like, even though when Johnny sings it, it sounds like he wrote it, it sounds like he's, he's telling his story. But the fact that it's written by, you know, a 22 year old kid in his bedroom, it's just fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating how that yeah. works. Yeah. Or I see a darkness in <laughs> Johnny Cash. Yeah. <laughs> Same deal. Same deal. You know? I, I I wanted to I wanted to, now that I've I've always wanted to see the two of you guys together and and ask about that that scenario which, which was uh, Rick. I saw you at a party. I I just gotten back from a, tour, a European tour with Will, and we had an, a bonus show in New York. And I knew that you had you had been in contact with you you would ask for some Will records because you were work, working with Johnny Cash. You were interested in in him checking out Will's music. I, I, I had that intel, so I went up to you, invited you to the show, and you, and you were enthusiastic, and you went to the show, and then you guys could take over from there just about how it came to pass that Johnny Cash ended up doing one of Will's songs. 
Well, I didn't remember what, what you just, I didn't remember meeting you at a party. Yeah. I didn't remember coming to the show, although I did remember seeing you in New York, uh, Will, at, um, where was it? Bowery Ballroom. Yeah, and it was, it was a mesmerizing show. It was a mesmerizing show. It was a mind-blowing show. And, and that's where, and then I think that's where, I think that's where you, yeah, you said that you all had cut the song and, and were, you know, and you, you, you said if I wanted to come out and, or come to a session and play the piano part on it, that, that, that was something that was needed for the song. And, and, and I agreed and we exchanged numbers. And then a couple of days later, I, I called you and left a message admitting that I didn't know how to play the piano and <laughs> asking if I could, it, I, I think I said just, that I had no expectations, but the only if there was any way that I could be around John and June for for any moments because they were, you know, together and separately he- heroes, and and it's so rare, you know, because of so many bizarre communication and other logistical walls, it's so rare for younger musicians to have access to their heroes, and so here's this little crack, and I was just like, if I could, you know, yeah. You, you, I had your ear, and if I could, if I could just sit and watch them do something, working, and you were kind enough to say, "Yeah, okay." How did you guys meet? On the street, uh, th- via our friend Britt Walford, the drummer from Slint. And Britt and Britt and I grew up together. Yeah, but it, it was it was it was when like the the I See a Darkness record. We we, I, we my brother and some other musicians and I had started a a small a smaller record label than Drag City um, to put out a few records, including I see a darkness. And and since we were in many ways, starting from scratch, I, I moved to the big city to, uh, you know, get a, to hire, hire a publicist and just to be more present for the, the delivery of this record than, uh, because I just knew I, I needed to be just to figure out, well, how do you put a record out? And, and so I was in, in New York and that's when we, we started to become friends. Tell me about the, um, the choice of recording under different names for a long time, I thought, you know, records, why not file them under the title of the record? Because they are such, you know, oftentimes such different and distinct entities. Um, and, they, you know, it can be completely like it could be the same artist, but there's no, nobody else except for the artist, the art, you know, quote unquote artist, that's the same from another record. So why not just say it's a record? It's this record. And so for just a, a few years in the 90s and in, in when I was trying to figure out what it was to make music and write songs and make records, just thought, uh, well, I don't, you know, for me, I just want to make records. I don't want to create a, an artist persona or an artist name or a band or anything like that. I just want to make a record, you know, keep making records and thought, well, if I modify the name a little bit just to reflect that you should be focusing on the record and not on anything else, it turned out, you know, I learned in a few years, just the model was too foreign to how things work. And, and people started to, you know, s- say, well, what's up with the names? And it's like, no, no, that was the opposite. You know, it's, what, uh, you know, so I realized like, oh, well, just come up with a name and then forget about it. So I just came up with the name Bonnie Prince Billy and just, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a way for distributors and, you know, streaming services to, you know, organize things. From the outside, it seemed like you were doing whatever you could to have people not find your work. That's what it seemed uh-huh. like. I never, it just like, it's like, well, I guess he doesn't want us to hear it. Because- well, want to want people to find it not based on a name, yeah. you know, based on, you know, way based on, do you, oh, hearing it on the radio or a friend saying, I like this song. Do you like this song? Yes, I like this song. And not like, oh, I'm so into fucking, you know, whatever, the birthday party. It's like, okay. <laughs> That's cool. That's that said, I'm so into yeah. the birthday. Or I'm party. so into the Rolling Stones, and you just be like, okay, well, you know, yeah, Bridges to Babylon, insane record, dude. But you know, yeah, so so just you know, have it be as much about the music as possible. That was that was it, and just have it not be as you know as little bullshit as possible, so that when you go to play shows, you know, you don't have a bunch of you know people who don't care where they are. They care where they are. They you know, you have a room yeah. full of uh, good it's energy. Wi- it's a wild choice. You know, Rick. I, I so so when I met when I met Will, we, so we had a friendship through our friend Britt. But then in the office, I asked him the same question because he had just made this record, Galassia Darkness, and he was calling himself Bonnie Prince Billy. And so I remember, like, I was actually sitting behind a desk, and I was like, "Dude, why are you calling it Bonnie Prince Billy?" And I remember Will, you go, "I'm trying to alienate my fan base." <laughs> <laughs> 
It worked. Yeah. yeah. No, it didn't work. <laughs> Because I was kidding. You know, because <laughs> it's the opposite happened. I mean, it's the idea is just like yeah. so that now yeah. I can still we can you know we can go play shows and I can I can look forward to meeting people, which I do. Yeah. Because because there was a consistency. Because people are there, not because of you know whatever they they're there because they they're anticipating that they may witness some music that's going to do something for them. Do you remember when you each heard the other one for the first time? Yeah, I had I knew Will's recorded music and I'd seen him play live. But yeah, the first I mean, again, it happened really quickly. Like Will came over to where me and Britt were staying and I had a guitar and I was dicking around on it and Will said, Oh, that sounds really good. <laughs> and uh and then we were recording a few days later. Recording a few days later for for what? There's a French film director named Bertrand Bonello and he had made a uh he was weight making a movie called Quelque Shows d'Organique and he wanted to uh I think he wanted to license a song that that I had recorded, and I said I don't like to license songs, but if you would consider commissioning a song, I'd like to, you know, I'd love to write a song, you know, and if you have the time to do that, and and he he bit, so he, you know, I, I he told me the story and gave me gave us a time frame, and that's right when Matt picked up his guitar and I was working on this song and just said I'm supposed to record this song sometime in the next couple of weeks are you down and it was interesting it was it was kind of around the time that i had i I feel like turned a corner on guitar and i could sort of confidently finger pick and and i i had kind of made a leap in playing guitar come to think of it actually like like i i had sort of gotten finger picking down right when i met you will yeah it felt it felt new to you like you were really writing it yeah it was really exciting matt what had you done already in music at this point when you met will I had done, uh, I had, when I met Will, I, was, I, I had already done Chavez, which was my 90s rock band, which still maybe we'll play again. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so I had done that and it had been slowing down. Uh, the the other band members were moving on with their lives and stuff. So, so I was, I actually had some time and was sort of in a space of, uh, not having my regular band to play with. And I sang for that band and that band was very much of a uh, collaborative kind of thing. And then all of a sudden I kind of didn't have as much to do and I'd been finger picking and stuff. And it was, it was fortuitous that I met like a good singer who was, who shared a lot of the same uh, tastes in music that I did and whose songs I liked, which is Will. And you played and sang? Me, yeah. I didn't know that you sang. Come on, dude. Had no idea. You didn't really? Had no idea. I had a really exciting moment, Rick. I was opening on a tour for Bjork and there was a couple of days off and I wanted to see, and we were in, in the New York area. So I went out to Montauk because uh, I wanted to see it. I'd never been there and, you know, got a motel room and I went to the gas station. They had DVDs for rent and I rented a DVD to watch a movie in my little motel room. And it's, it's a movie about, it's a sort of a comedy, a meth comedy, a, you know, a crystal meth comedy called Spun. And I just put it on. And this, you know, the opening song comes on. It's really cool sounding. It sounds fucking great. And just the music sounds great. And then, uh, and it's guitars. And then this voice comes on and I'm like, oh, I know this voice. I know that it's, this song's so cool. It's so good. It's so effective. I know this voice, but I couldn't figure out what it was. And I had to wait to the end credits. And it turns out it was Sweeney singing a cover of uh, uh, Iron Maiden's Number of the Beast with the sort of acoustic version of the Zwan band that that he was a part of back the, in the early 2000s. Amazing. Yeah. Was it just the two of you? It was just me playing guitar and Corrigan kind of licking. Yeah. Yeah. It's really a sweet, sweet sounding song and, and, the, and the vocals are awesome. So as soon as that, that, you know, discontinued, the first thing that I think either of us did musically when Zwan ended was get together and make the Superwolf record. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, what, what had happened was, uh, the, yeah, the, the Zwan stopped playing kind of in the middle of a tour. All of a sudden I was back in New York and Will wrote and said, hey, I have a show, I have a solo show booked at a big venue in London. Would you want to maybe come and, you know, I'll come over there and you could play a couple of songs and stuff. And there was a tacit understanding that I was kind of screwed, I think, on, on Will's part. So it was, it was a nice offer for just for something to, for me to f and do. And then and I said, yes. And then he wrote and, and the email, he wrote an email and said challenge. And he said, hey, how about I send you some lyrics and you write some songs 
and we play them at that show. So I said, okay. And so then he sent the lyrics to... What are you, Beast for Thee, and Bed is for Sleeping? Yeah, and so 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 that was the beginning of Super Bowl. So I have these lyrics, you know, and and I have to write a song to play in front of like 3,000 people in London in like a month or something like that. Um, Unbelievable. And it's a challenge when somebody says that. It's, it's kind of terrifying, you know what I mean? But then at the same time, it made me respond, you know, and getting these incredible lyrics and then being like, holy shit, I have this guy thinks I'm good enough to do this. And then that made me do good work. It just makes me wonder, why do you guys ever make music apart? <laughs> In order to make that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. The, the joy of collaboration is, is, comes from accessing somebody else's world. And if, the, if, if you're already fully full-time accessing that person's world, it, you, you know, it's, the joy is, yeah, going out and doing things and then coming back together and, and saying, back. this is what I got. Oh, yeah, well, this is what I got. Oh, no, you also have this. Amazing. Yeah, for sure. It, like, I was thinking when I was listening to that, I was like, God, it, it really is cool how, how this music sounds, the, the record that, that that's coming out sounds like this record that's 16 years old. Like, it's just, it's all one thing. But I was thinking that, the reason that this rec- that the new record is good has a lot to do with experiences that I had with you, Rick, just as far as like being thrown so many curveballs in, in high pressure situations, you know what <laughs> I mean? Like, I mean, dude, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I, I told you the first time that I met you, Rick, I was like, I was like, thanks. I don't know what I'm, what do I do? I don't know what I'm doing. And, and you had, you had this really empowering line, you know, I, I was like, so this is we were recording Johnny Cash songs. We were recording just to a click track and Johnny Cash's voice, and it's Tom Petty's band, and I'm the new guy, <laughs> and it's Tom Petty's band plus Smokey Hormel, who's like the world's greatest guitar player, and then it's me, and I just, and Rick had invited me into this into this group, and <laughs> I, I, and and I, you know I was like like do I like just make up stuff like what I would do normally like just kind of make up stuff like what if that's not appropriate and and you go <laughs> Rick says. You're isolated. We could just hit a race. <laughs> <laughs> Did I really say that? Like, yes. <laughs> really funny. But what was so great, it was a great thing because I was like, it totally made, yeah, have you know, fun. It made me feel have really, fun. really free. 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 And also, I, I, think you, I, I think you said, you know, I think you said, you know, you do you, like do what you want to do. You're isolated. We could always hit a race. And then he kind of gave a devilish smile. Um, but like, that was a really big deal. <laughs> you know, just even that was like, all oh, right. You know, like, I definitely felt like go- going back in with Will was like, okay, I could I could get to where we need to go quicker, and I and I feel way more sure footed and stuff. And also, I'm really grateful that I had the time to be to stumble around in the dark and be terrified and and have all these experiences that led like I can't sound the way that I sound that I sound now without having all this crazy you know face plants and successes and, and just general uh, high wire terror <laughs> that, 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 that you provided me with. <laughs> so thanks. Well, the, re- the reason you were there was to do what you do. That's the only, like, if it was just to have someone play guitar, there's a lot of people who play guitar, but I wanted Matt Sweeney to play guitar. And the only reason you want Matt Sweeney to play guitar is because he plays like Matt Sweeney. <laughs> Yeah, it's so cool how Matt Sweeney plays like Matt Sweeney. Just like him, <laughs> it's it's amazing. It's, so ex- it's ridiculous. It's exciting to be in the recording studio and to hear you know to, and to hear it you know going down on tape or what what, what passes for tape right now is just to, to hear it and to just think, wow, there it is. It's right there. It's really right funny there that your uh, you had that moment renting a DVD and hearing a voice and wondering who it was yeah. and it being Matt and me yeah. listening to the Super Wolf album and hearing that guitar and going who is that and yeah, both yeah, yeah. of us came to matt in, in in it's interesting that like for you the vocal was the spark for me the guitar was the spark but it definitely came from not knowing what we were listening to to like whoa this and to to hear something that you don't know what it is and to care enough about finding what it is is a really big deal that doesn't happen. Really like, yeah, it doesn't happen so often, especially in the pre Shazam days. It was really, uh, yeah, a job to make that happen. Now I was ta- I was talking to someone about the first time I heard the uh, Sean Marshall Cat Power, and and it was on the radio in Virginia somewhere, and it was a, a woman singing this 
exploded, deconstructed version of Hank Williams, I Can't Help It If I'm Still in Love With You. And it took oh, me so months, good. months of asking people, do you know, I heard this song. You didn't, and, No, I don't know what you're talking about. And they would give me these stupid ideas of who it could have been. No, 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 no. You don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> it's this crazy <laughs> thing. It's, you know, and it, months. Yeah, yeah. And now it is a little easier. The, the music you guys make is I could literally listen to it forever. It's <laughs> unbelievable. It's like, it, it, I might like listening to your music more than any other music. So it really is ridiculous what it, how it, I feel like I'm the audience. You're making it for me. It's, it is ridiculous. Uh, it's, I mean, it's ridiculous, but I, I think, I, I think that some of that is, you know, when we were when we had this sequenced and then mastered, my brother Paul mastered it, and my wife and I, you know, one evening were ready to listen to the master and and listen to it all the way through, and in the, throughout the record, I was listening to it. I was crying sometimes, and I was laughing a whole lot. And you know, my wife asked, you know, she's like, "Why are you laughing?" And and it's hard to fully explain, but part of it is gratitude for the way that it came together because it ended up coming together in such a way that it is a, the things that records have done for me is not something that's easy to find. I just, it felt good to, yeah, to have participated in making a record that has this kind of content, uh, musical and lyrical content, and that it's worth sitting with it song after song. And and I think I kept laughing because I would remember where I was in the record and think, oh, this part still hasn't happened. And I feel like this. And this part is still going to happen. And I feel like this. It's been a long time since I've been carried away uh, by a new record, I guess. It, it's funny in this year, this crazy year where, where, where everyone's perception is so 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 different, but but just feeling like, wow, it's not a bad record to, you know, if if a plague takes us, you know, I'm, I feel okay about this being the record that we ended things with. It's really a beauty. It's a beauty. Thanks, Rick. Anything different in the process between making this album and the first album 16 years ago? Yeah. We had a Tuareg band. On the Super Wolf record, the only outside musician is Pete, right? Yeah, yeah. Is Pete Townsend the drummer. You know, so it was, it was that, it was insular. And then with this one, which is pretty interesting, that, that the way that this record got kickstarted was, was Will and I had done a recording session with Mdu Mokhtar, who, Rick, have you checked him out yet? Mm-mm. Oh my God, you're going to fucking lose your mind. Okay, so Mdu Mokhtar is a Tuareg guy, like, like Tanor when he's, he's from... He's from Niger, yeah. Yeah, he, he's from Niger, Niger, he's from the desert, and he, he's an explosive, mind-blowing musician. And... Uh, we got a chance to to use him and his band on a song that Will and I had already written. And the song was actually like had a lot of parts and a lot of this and that to it. And these guys nailed it, which is pretty wild because they're not like trained musicians. They and they, they play a very specific style. But because we had such an incredible connection with these guys, and particularly like that they seemed to actually vibe. I mean, they clearly vibed with how Will sang and how I played guitar. Like we, we meshed and that was exciting and definitely exciting enough for, uh, because Will and I had, had already been exchanging, writing songs with the idea of recording, but this was enough to, for Will to be like, well, I guess we should probably use them as a band, you know, and tr- you know, try writing like, maybe that should be, that's, that's the way we start the Super Bowl for record. Just like use, this mind-blowing band and see what happens and so we did yeah cause we, we had we had, a, we had a we had a fantastic recording session with them on another on another unrelated song and or everybody everybody at the end of the day you know it's one of those days in the recording studio where everybody's glowing at the end of the day and you just think w- we'd like to do this again sometime oh yeah we would too let's do it again you know so it was just up to when when they were going to come back to the united states of america and when they did you know we said well if you've got a few extra days in new york can we book a session and we'll go back in and do more and then, so we knew we had to get, we knew we had to get our act together by then. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the songs that we recorded in that session, uh, one was a composition that came together with all of us in a room, which is also like very, very, very different than everything else. Um, 
uh, which is everything. Yeah. Every, so yeah, every, every, like the night before the session, you know, the afternoon before the session, the song didn't exist in any way, shape or form. And then that, that night we all got together in an apartment and everything, all of the music, all of the lyrics, all the melodies, everything came together that night. And then we tracked it. The next and as far as like the power of like music connecting, uh, just they where the, the town that they live in is a 28 hour bus ride to the nearest airport. Okay. <laughs> like, so like these guys are, from a different place, you know. So, so you know, the, the the connection, it felt good, you know. And and uh, so we we came up with the song together, and then then we also got to use them on songs that we had written before. Um, so and and we we were pretty conscientious about what we were what what the other songs were, you know, like sort of taking advantage of using these musicians. For for example, uh, the the song "I'm a Youth," which is an Irish traditional a traditional irish song well just, again addressing the differences between the 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 you know emdu's on that but the first record we did it you know with, we spent probably up to a year putting the songs together then we went in and for a week tracked and mixed uh in shelbyville kentucky one session the two of us my brother paul engineering our friend pete playing drums this time you know we wrote over the course of five years and did it in two sessions one in new york and then the other in, in Nashville with Ferg, and then the Emdu Mokhtar ensemble playing on the New York thing. So those are the significant differences in, in how the record itself was, the, the two records were made. So check out Hall of Death, if, I mean, as far as like, a, it, just as an example, this is what happened when we got together with these gentlemen from a, from a very different place. You know, we, we put the song out as, as a single a couple few weeks ago, right? And, and people have talked about it and there's been a positive response to it, right? right? Um, Ha there has been, as far as anything that I've heard from anybody, I, I haven't heard word one mentioning the fact that there are lyrics to the song, much less what the lyrics are. You know, in general, it's interesting that people don't really listen to lyrics. You know, most people will say, I don't even listen to the lyrics. You know, that's that's what streaming the streaming model is built around, is, is people not listening to lyrics. Like when we made the song in the recording studio, we made the song, we, we, we tracked it all live except for the, the lead uh, guitar and that was that's Emdu's guitar uh and for some reason I can't remember if he was I think he maybe he had a he had, a friend of his had like died in a automobile accident in Africa and so he was on the phone and and you know he was so overwhelmed with grief uh he couldn't play with us so we played and then I think two days later we like you know would you play on this song and and he's he's sitting there to go into play and uh we're all sitting there I'm sitting on the floor at his feet and Matt says, well, you know, to help M Mdu, why don't you, Will, why don't you explain, you know, what the song is about? And I'm taken aback because, you know, I didn't have this, I wrote the lyrics on three days before. And so I didn't filter anything, you know, and, and it's essentially just about the horror and desperation of, of years of having, of, of my mom living in, you know, being incommunicado, because of Alzheimer's disease and living in a nursing home and what it's like to go to her, you know, on a, on a extremely regular basis. And so, okay, I'll fucking explain these lyrics. I'm not sure if it's going to help his guitar playing or not. We'll see, you know, with this song. Because in the past, I've seen Will like be like, Hey, the song's about this. So, so, so go like that. You know, like, like I've seen, I've seen you give that direction or I had seen you go that direction before. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, and also, I'm kind of curious because all I know, I think I knew, I don't know if I really heard, could hear any of the things, because we uh, any of the actual words. I could hear the melody that he was singing, but everything was live. We, were, we, we recorded the song live. The vocal is live in a really loud room, you know, so so I did not know what the words were. So I figured, you know, and, and you know, how is M.D. going to know what the words are anyway? So then Will says what the words are about, and it's shocking, you know. And and it spurs a conversation then because Emdu begins to go into a tirade about how shitty Americans are to their elders. And, you know, I have a similar sense, you know, like the horror of visiting my mom, you know, a huge part of the horror of visiting my mom in this place is is thinking like, what brought circumstances, you know, what, what brought this circumstance to happen that my mother, that I... I'm a responsible human being, a functioning fucking responsible human being. And, and I don't have it, you know, I can't live a life and also take care, 
take care of her. And there's not a support system to take care of her so that she can stay at home, you know. But but he's, you know, basically like hammering everything that I felt shitty about in my life for the past five years and just saying, you, you know, you suck. You fucking suck because this is who you are, yeah. you know. That's what I'm hearing, you know. Yeah. So, you know, and then and then I, I eventually like have to leave. I'm so upset. I have to leave, and and this the session kind of falls apart that week. I don't sleep for days. Anyway, I I, I hear it as like one one of the strengths I think of my working with with Matt is that he allows for a greater amount of vulnerability uh, in the in the lyric, uh, and then also in the in the in the singing. And I hear nothing but this horrific vulner vulnerability in that song, and so. And it's also, you know, I hear the electricity of the excitement of our collaboration with the ensemble from Niger. Um, but I, it it sits for me beautifully in the record because I, you know, because it's, it's you know, people, people say like, oh, it's this propulsive rock song, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, to me, it's this, you know, really hard song about how we what do you do about the fact that, you know, that you are of the guilty, mistreating children in these death institutions, you know, these institutions that are built around, you know, allowing people to die ignored. Heavy jam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heavy jam. Anything else you guys feel like we should talk about? Anything that would be helpful or interesting? I think we did good. You're really good at this, Rick. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Lots of love. Thanks to Matt Sweeney and Will Oldham for talking about their creative collaboration with Rick. To hear Super Wolves along with our favorite Bonnie Prince Billy songs, head to brokenrecordpodcast.com. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash brokenrecordpodcast, where you can find new and old episodes. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Martin Gonzalez, Eric Sandler, and Jennifer Sanchez. With engineering help from Nick Chafee, our executive producer is Mia LaBelle. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music is by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. Peace. Peace.